younger alums, really we're talking about those alums of the program about 10 years and out. Uh, beyond that, we recognize the need to develop further our leaders that graduated from this program. And so the way to do that that we figured out was to try to launch what we're calling the YALS, or Young Alumni Learning Series. The inaugural YALS is a three-part series focused on leadership development. Um, part of that series uh, will be Sarah Haight, who will kick it off today. Then we'll have John Armistead in two weeks. And then wrap up at the very end with Scott Savage doing um, a humble leadership discussion. I, I do want to thank my fellow executive committee members, and especially Bob Weber, who is very instrumental, as well as Mary Vincent, our intern, who has done a fabulous job in setting up this program. I'm very excited. I hope that you can attend all three. And we're really looking to kind of create a forum of both learning and networking for our younger alums. And really is my pleasure to moderate the session today. So rather than take up any more time with introductions or anything like that, I do want to go ahead and just turn it over to our first speaker, Sarah White. As many of you know, uh, Sarah is currently, currently a pharmacy leadership coach and faculty for the Pharmacy Leadership Academy. Sarah has served as the director of pharmacy at Stanford Hospital and Clinics, as well as the associate director of pharmacy at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Sarah completed a bachelor's in pharmacy from Oregon State University and a master's from the Ohio State University and her residency program at Ohio State University Hospitals and Clinics. Uh, she has served as an ASHP president and has received the Harvey A.K. Whitney Lecture Award. Um, we are very lucky to have Sarah, and it is my pleasure to turn it over to her now. Thank you, John and Mary. It's been a pleasure to work with you. And as you're getting on, if you're on the phone, this technology requires you to put in an audio pin that you find as you sign on to the computer. Uh, otherwise, you may not be able to speak. Um, and you're all muted, which is that red um, cross uh, of either your green microphone if you've got the attendee list. Um, so as we want to have a discussion, um, and I think we've got right now 32 people, so we have a good number of folks. And what I've been asked to talk about is called followership. So Mary, if you want to advance the slide, we'll talk about sort of the three learning objectives that we'll try to accomplish in the time we have together. Uh, we want to talk about appropriate leadership skills for followers and remember that everybody has a boss. So even if you're the director of pharmacy or you're the CEO of your organization, there's somebody or some group above you. So in, in many senses, we are all followers. Um, we want to describe some resources for younger alumni and then uh, talk a little bit about utilizing a professional development and networking plan as you move your career along. And we're well aware that some of you have a number of folks with you uh, and we appreciate uh, having Having those people as well. There is a chat box that you'll notice and if you want to communicate with us other than verbally then uh, type in that chat box and Mary and John are going to uh, monitor that and we'll get back to you. This session is being recorded as you heard and will be available um, on the uh, the uh, Lashley Leadership Program website. Um, there will also be CE available for this, and Mary will be talking about that as we sort of finish this up. So with that introduction, um, Mary, let's move to the, the next slide, if you would. What we want to do is not necessarily a lecture per se, but really have a discussion and a dialogue. Um, and in the CE parlance these days, it's called active learning. But I think we learn so much from each other. So if you look on the, if you click on the attendees, I'm hoping you can, I think you can see who else is on. And then across the top above your name, you'll see uh, a hand. And if you click on that hand, we know you want to say something and we'll unmute you and, and let you uh, have a discussion and share your uh, concerns or your experiences, which is part of the uh, active learning dialogue sort of area. What I'd like to first do is find that hand and those of you that are in, uh, well, let's actually, Mary, let's move to the next slide and then I'll, then I'll do that. So you are probably aware of the 
big L, little L leadership concepts. The big L leaders, if I ask you who are the leaders in your organization or your department, you're always going to think about people that have a leadership title, a director, a manager, a clinical coordinator, a CEO, those type of titles. Um, but clearly we need every pharmacist to be a little L leader on their shift and in their practice. So what I'm interested in you doing, if you do currently have a formal leadership title, you know, could be clinical pharmacist, I guess, as well, would you raise your hand by clicking the hand beside your name along the top? And we'll see how many folks we've got that are big L leaders. Okay. Excellent. I think I lost them somehow, but that's okay. Good. We've got a good, good, okay, I see. I'm learning this technology too. Now I need to click them so they're all at the top. All right. Now I'm functional with this. Remember I went through pharmacy school on a slide rule, so using all of this is, is really an interesting endeavor. Um, so we've got, you know, five, six, seven folks that have got their hands raised, so thank you for doing that. Um, so, you know, the big L, little L leader concept is sort of where followership comes from. So um, why don't we um, sort of start out with one more slide and then I'm going to open it up to you for uh, more uh, discussion. Uh, so Mary, if you could, as I thought about why is leadership crucial? And the sorts of things, and I'm going to have, I've got Fred Eckel, I've got uh, Roger Anderson, some other folks that Mike McGee, I think, some folks that have been around a while that have actually lived through many of these things that are listed on here, is how we really built uh, hospital health system pharmacy, call it pharmacy service heritage. And clearly the big L leaders were involved, but I can assure you it was every pharmacist and every tech that made these things work and, and helped us with the, what the system should be. So if you think about where we've really come from as a uh, health system pharmacy profession, uh, I remember the days when I first got into uh, pharmacy out of school. Now, granted, that was, you know, 69, 70 type, <laughs> um, you know, and we practiced in pharmacy school, actually role played how to not tell a patient the name of their medication because that was a purview of the physician. We knew we needed to counsel patients. Uh, we knew we needed to make the admixtures. The nurses were not uh, compounding those appropriately. It wasn't their fault. They just didn't know the kind of uh, chemical uh, compounding that we know. Um, we began to use pharmacy techs, pharmacists going on rounds for clinical pharmacy. I got to read one chart in pharmacy school, didn't really go on pharmacy rounds. Unit dose systems evolved. Now we have many unit-based cabinets, computerization, physician order entry, electronic medical records. And so the real challenge for those of you younger is where do we go from here and how do we really do that? And my point being that, yes, the big L leaders were involved, but clearly uh, I know the programs and most of these I was involved in as well in developing. It really was the frontline pharmacy folks, techs and pharmacists, who knew how we needed to make these work and really fine-tuned them and made sure they work. So, um, you know, that's um, an important aspect. Uh, Roger or Fred, do you want to comment on this whole how we built health system pharmacy um, and, and what your experience is? Fred, why don't you go ahead? I've unmuted you and I'm going to unmute Roger. Can you hear me, Sarah? This is Roger. Yeah, go ahead, Roger. Does this work? Can you hear me? It does. We can hear both of you. Why don't can you, you hear why me? Don't you go first? Yes, I can, Fred. Can you hear us? Okay. Yes. Okay. So okay. I think we built it through a lot of people who work, who are willing to work hard, put the needs of the patients ahead of themselves, and and do some uh, things that hadn't been done before. Yes. And it exactly. required people working together collaboratively to make things happen because none of us knew what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good insight. Thanks, Fred. Roger, go ahead. Yeah, 
I can just really kind of add to what Fred said, and he's absolutely correct. Uh, many of us were getting into these programs without really a lot of, uh, or almost no past uh, knowledge of what they would be or would turn out to be. So it was really a creative uh, process uh, that just continued. And, uh, you know, we, we and I can, we can give ourselves at Ohio State a lot of credit for some of these programs because some of the earliest programs, particularly the Ivy Admixture programs, were really born, uh, pretty much born at Ohio State. And uh, I can think of some of the seminars that we put on that helped to communicate and teach pharmacists all over the country over the next several years. So uh, I think uh, y y we're all on the same page here in, in how we implemented these and moved forward. Thank you both. Uh, Mary, let's go to the next slide. One of the things as I've um, taught and worked with residents is being a pharmacist and being a leader, we get in ourselves hung up with being the perfectionist that we need to be as a pharmacist. When we set these systems up, we didn't know, Fred and Roger Wright, we weren't sure what we were doing, but we didn't let that stop us. And what I see people doing today is being too much of a pharmacist in the leadership mode um, and wanting everything to be perfect. And we never want to lose that on the drug therapy side. No question, we never lose perfection on the drug therapy side. But when you think about the leadership, and I've kind of, my gray hat is sort of the pharmacist where the red hat is sort of the leader. The leader has to take risks, has to be willing to learn as they go, to make mistakes, which we never want to do with drug therapy, and so this let go of perfection, and if you really think about the, the scale that I've kind of put on there, there's good, very good, excellent, and then perfect is way off the scale. And so, again, never lose that on drug therapy, but we've got to put on another hat as sort of how I teach it or however you want to think about it when we're trying to further our service move into areas, whether it's accountable care organizations, transitions of care, the things today that we don't know what we're doing with, and that's okay, um, but it means we've got to let go of that perfectionist, and I know that's hard. Um, I find myself redoing slides more than it really deserves, um, and as you work with young folks, with students and residents, help them to understand the difference between sort of the gray perfectionist hat and the red leadership hat, because it's really about a 180 degree difference of what we need to be doing as we are, are going to be in this leadership sort of mode. So, with that sort of introductory, let's go one more slide, Mary, and then I'm going to ask you guys to comment what, if you think about this, in your current roles, what do you need to change, stop being a perfectionist with? And let's see here. Um, does anybody uh, put your hand up and volunteer, or uh, I've taught enough, I'm going to be calling on you if you don't volunteer? Um, Mike McGee, I, I see you on here somewhere. Let me get you unmuted, though. Um, Mike, what, what, do you need to, what do you need to give up uh, being a perfectionist with? Well, uh, Sarah, hey, can you hear Mike? me? Can you hear me, Mary? Yeah, I can. Sarah? Thanks, sir. Okay. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think I've heard uh, you, Roger, and Fred at one point or another talk about uh, managing ambiguity, and I, I really underscore what you're saying as far as trying to be a perfectionist. So I, I find it all the time. I have to fight that because I fight my pharmacy tendencies to be a perfectionist. So uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. So a specific thing for me is when I'm doing a business plan. I, you know, I, I want to nail down the exact dollar impact I'm going to have, and I want to be real specific about it, but quite frankly, there's so many variables that you can't really do that. And yet, from a drug therapy pharmacist perspective, we always want to do that. So I, I absolutely agree with you that uh, that's one thing I got to fight all the time because at the end of the day, it's all about making your best business guess and moving forward with that. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong and just living with it. Yeah, and, and it's better to do more things not as perfectly 
than to have one thing perfect. And you're right, there's no way. It's not like kinetically dosing where we need to know exactly. And it's just that sort of having that conversation with yourself about what do I need to stop being a perfectionist with as I'm trying to set up and figure out, um, you know, the services. Who else wants to comment on this? What what else do you need to to give up on? The, give up being a perfectionist on? Either raise your hand, or if you know how to unmute. The only reason we need you to raise your hand is so we can unmute you, so we don't have a lot of background noise, so you can talk. Um, Joe, do you want to? Hey, Sarah. Uh, this is jo Joe. This is John. Go ahead. Yes. Sarah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull a I'm gonna pull a classic move, and I'm gonna ask a question um, in response to your okay. question. Um, All right. What uh, what do you what do you do as a little L leader or a big L leader, and you're on a team, and you're stuck with a bunch of perfectionists, right? Which never happens in pharmacy. Do you have any advice for our younger alumni on or younger folks on how to maybe keep those people moving forward and keeping the momentum moving? Well, and I think that's an excellent application of this concept. I think it's having a discussion with the team about the pharmacist perfection that we never want to lose with drug therapy, but then contrasting it with the characteristics of leadership, which are taking risks, um, you know, not having everything perfect, learning as you go, and all of that being okay. Um, because, again, it's... It's interesting, as Mike said, and I still have that challenge too, even though I talk about this, um, of talking to yourself and making sure that intellectually you can know this, emotionally letting go is another. But I think just having a, a discussion with the team and then at any point saying, are we being too much of a perfectionist here? As Mike said, you know, I want every uh, penny accounted for. Is that being too much of a perfectionist? Because as we kind of joke among ourselves, then we let go of that a bit. But I think it's huge. I think we hold ourselves up because we aren't willing to step forward. Uh, and there's always been this sort of changes in healthcare, and there's never been a better time to be a pharmacist um, and you know make sure our expertise is widely used. Um, can you think of John some ideas of ways to to do this? I yeah, and and I I think that's a great answer, Sarah. And for me, you know, I found a little bit of success with actually. Um, that self-awareness piece is like, you know, make a joke about, you know, hey, we're all type A. We all want it to be perfect, but we also know that perfection is going to kill us. And so, you know, the, the self-recognition and the knowing what um, each member of the team likes to be perfect at and, and recognizing each team member's strengths and weaknesses as it, re as it relates to perfection, I think is really interesting because then you can actually um, use those, those um, differences to the benefit of the project where you might plug someone in on a, on a particular issue and then maybe take someone off based on their tendencies for perfection. But I think the self-awareness and the team awareness is a, a great first step. Well, and, and I found I needed to give my staff permission frequently to challenge the status quo. Because, you know, once upon a time, the decisions we made were valid. Things have changed, and it's okay to say, to challenge how are we doing things. How we organize and process our work is totally up to us, and there's not one right answer. As you heard Roger and Fred say, we, we just went ahead with things, and we need to continue, and I know most of you are continuing to uh, explore new ways to deliver our services. Um, so think about this whole concept uh, Try to solve it with yourself and then help others that you work with because I think this is huge in terms of the whole profession and never lose that with my drug therapy. <laughs> Don't misread what I'm saying. We have to be a tad schizophrenic and you never lose being a pharmacist. You're always a pharmacist even if your total job is leadership. That's the underpinning of where you come from but how you play that out and how you help the people around you and those that work with you is what's so I think super um, critical. Uh, Mary, let's go to the next slide because then if you say what do we need to stop being a perfectionist with, in terms of the followership, what would you change if you could? 
And um, let's have some of you, uh, you know, just off the top of your head, what frustrates you about your workplace? What would you change if you could? And then we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about how do you partner with your superior as a follower to get some of that done. Allie, I see you on the call. Why don't you, as a an ad, second year admin resident, uh, what do you want to change in your current practice? What would you change if you could? And you're unmuted, Allie. Can't really hear you, Allie. Can you up your volume? Go ahead, Allie. Can't, I'm sorry, Allie, but I can't really hear you. How about some of the rest of you? What, uh, Andrea, what would you... Andrea, what would you change if you could? A discussion really needs some other folks participating. Carla, let me unmute you. What, what would you? What what frustrates you about things you see happening? Or I'm sorry, Carl. I'm sorry, Carl Fink. You're unmuted. Rachel, I'm going to unmute you. Give us an example of what you'd like to change. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. What would I change in my current practice? Sure. Um, I would. I would like to see a change in. Um, I would say uh, two things that are coming to mind is um, a continual alignment of strategic goals to what we do in our current practice on either a daily or weekly basis and ensuring that what we prioritize our time around is um, focusing on those main priorities that we have. Um, and then the second thing would be ensuring that we're communicating, um, whether that's between um, within our leadership team as well as disseminating that information um, effectively to uh, those that work below us, um, including staff members, technicians, um, staff pharmacists, and making sure that they understand the changes that we're making, um, why we're making them, and if they're effective for them, because that's why we're making those changes. Um, so and just ensuring that that communication is getting to them in the best um, format possible. Okay, those are excellent. Excellent choices. What's one one example of something you do? A specific, just something off the top would, of your head. Something specific I would do to make that change? Yeah, that you would focus on to implement um, those ideas. I would probably, um, I, would, I think I would get a focus group, especially um, to work on the communication, I think. Um, possibly bringing in more of those staff members to see what's the best way to um, discuss the community, the best way to get that communication to them and get that feedback to them. Um, and um, whether that is through an email or through staff huddles to make sure that they're understanding um, what our what our hopes and goals and uh, strategies are and to make sure that those, that information is getting to them and that they understand it and that um, and that how, what impact they can make on a day-to-day -day basis um, and uh, make sure that what they're doing um, comes back to us. So I think just creating some sort of um, small group to discuss how we can make that change. So I think it's just getting together um, a task force of different people at different levels, whether that's clinical specialists, technicians, management, and coming up with a plan of 
creating a good communication um, basis. So. Yeah, and, and I think you're so right around it being communication. We think just if we say something, that's communicated. And, you know, it really is what does somebody hear? And how do they want to receive the information or what works best for them? As you've indicated, is it emails mm -hmm. or because we get so many emails? You know, what are the keys really? And getting their feedback and their participation in it is so critical and that's followership you know you, you are a leader you've got somebody above you you've got somebody below you and the whole communication is something that again we we kind of do a little in pharmacy school but not near probably what we should do um, do others of you have either comments on what you would change or uh, how to be more effective as a communicator and I think what I learned is you've got to do it over and over again in a multitude of different ways that um, everybody hears it differently uh, and there's so much information it can get lost but you're right about aligning with the the uh, priorities in the organization and showing the frontline staff how that really impacts their job, what they're doing day in and day out, how that flows up through and not only helps the individual patients but the entire organization. So this is a sort of, you know, thinking about what do you want to change? I mean, that's how we sort of figured out that the MedAir study showed us that, that nursing was making a lot of errors because we were giving them stock bottles of drugs. And that's sort of how unit dose came about. Um, and certainly the errors in IV admixtures um, and other things. So it's a way of jointly saying where are the unmet needs, how can we change this, and learning as we go. So uh, thank you very much. Excellent examples. Other other people want to comment on what do you want to change and how you go about it? Hey, Sarah, this is John again. Yeah, go ahead. You know, I, I, this is such a great discussion. It led me to think about a question maybe to post to you and maybe the group is, you know, one of the things that I would change is that some of the, the best leaders that I've worked with know that in some roles they play the leader and then in others they play the follower, just depending on the, the meeting or, or the, the situation. But some of the worst leaders think that they're stuck in the leadership role, and then they try to act like a leader the entire time, even though the specific situation may not call for that. And so you end up having this dominating personality that really stifles conversation. And so how would you then give advice, or how would you help people learn how to switch roles from leader to follower and then be an effective communicator in that role? No, and that's that's an excellent question. Why don't we benefit a bit from Fred and Roger, who've been in the profession a, a long time? Let me, um, uh, Fred, let me un unmute you. And h how does one really learn to shift from, uh, you know, the leader to a follower as needed? Go ahead, Fred. Roger, I think you're unmuted, so jump in. Or you guys have got yourselves muted. You may need to go ahead, Roger. What no, I, share with us your? You know, as you've been talking here, I've been thinking about the, we're pretty much thinking about the leadership within our own departments. But the big thing to think about, and I always uh, had to emphasize this to our own staff, is that our communication and our leadership role and follower role within the whole organization is so much more, sometimes more important, or just as important. And particularly as we have programs that involve uh, nursing, for example, or uh, medical staff, or, or even the financial areas. That, that's another area of, uh, of uh, uh, focus that we have to many times do better than perhaps we have in the past. Well, and you might comment, Roger, on your experience because you were able at MD Anderson you report, talk about how you, who your boss was and how you leveraged that Relate, poor reporting relationship. Sure. Well, it started off in much more of a traditional hospital administration reporting uh, relationship, but uh, maybe particularly after we had implemented our basic uh, drug distribution, uh, patient-specific drug distribution pro programs and then started into our clinical practice programs, we made uh, proposals uh, to the executive leadership of the institution to move pharmacy 
more away from the typical hospital administrative line and more to the medical line. And in fact, uh, in the uh, uh, mid-80s, uh, uh, we were able to move the department uh, pharmacy into a full clinical division, as it was called at MD Anderson, which then gave us a much different audience uh, to be dealing with uh, and was very, very helpful to have uh, particularly the physician leadership help us at times with things that in the past we they might not even been aware that we wanted to do. So I think that the reporting relationship within pharmacy as it goes down the path of much more clinical focus, I hope more and more institutions can uh, come up with and have that kind of a, a reporting uh, structure. Excellent. Thanks, Fred. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm, I'm still learning this technology. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that, that at the same time that you're a leader, you're also a follower, which means that you've got to sort of be able to think in terms of what's the leadership function that I need to perform here and what's the followership function I need to be performing in this, in this situation. And that you know that's something that you have to work at, and I think it, I think it you work at it more when you can see yourself as a servant leader, who 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 are who is whose role is to facilitate others accomplishing their purposes. Uh, and anyway, at least that's the way I've sort of tried to build my career. No, I, I think you're exactly right. I think, you know, the, the command and control and the dictator never did really work, and it certainly doesn't work today. Um, and we've all, we all either win together or we sink together. And so it's your attitude um, which um, and how you position yourself. Um, the other thing I just remembered is why I put that blank sheet of paper on this slide as a visual is we are we have over the years tweaked and added layers and layers of complexity to our systems and you know we were doing that in response to various way things that happened but you know it might be time now to take some of your really young young staff or residents and say if you were to start from scratch the blank sheet of paper concept, how would you set this little piece of this system up? Now don't let them talk to the rest of the staff who will tell them all the reasons their more simplified approach <laughs> won't work, but it would be uh, helpful sometimes to just start from scratch um, so that the complexity to come out. And some of that goes back to what Rachel was saying about how does it align? How do we spend our time? Are we spending our time on the value added things both for the organization and the patient at this point in time and I'm afraid we just keep adding to rather than trying to maybe streamline or step back um, so as you're thinking about what changes and letting go of perfectionism think about that blank sheet of paper you want to do it on a little bit of pieces of things first you don't want to I mean it'd be nice if you start all over with systems but uh, and sometimes you have that chance when you automate or you do other things to really rethink what makes sense today given the resources we have given the needs we have to document our outcomes etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, uh, let's move Mary let's move to the next slide one of the things that we sort of circled around here is partnering with your superior because we've all got the superior um, and so how do you really partner with that person and uh, it really is a partnering uh, it's not a, I mean you could say you report to you do but you need to really know enough get to know that person and build a relationship um, with them um, and you're probably going to have some potential generational differences uh, they may be or may not be but generally are going to be maybe older and are looking at things a bit differently um, what's their style do they like to talk things through are they a verbal kind of style or do they want everything documented 
and graphs and data um, and is that how they want to work with you because you've got to fit your style to theirs to be really successful and don't make assumptions about that because um, you know you are going to maybe waste a lot of time and effort and establish common ground you know what do they like to do what are their priorities what are they trying to achieve and this is, again is that alignment that Rachel mentioned how can you align what your superior needs to get done with what you want to do within the pharmacy and you know get to know them ask about their careers um, what have, where have they come from um, more of the personal basis and then the age-old you know bring solutions don't just bring problems so that it's a together making them look good and uh, making it easy for them to say yes um, you know, one of the directors I knew, uh, Sherry Ramsey, who is retired, she said, you know, when you're dealing with administration, you need to sell what they're buying. And that's the alignment aspects. And I remember at Stanford, there was no equipment money for a certain period of time, except if it was a regulatory issue. Well, many of the medication management things are regulatory issues. So, you know, sometimes that doesn't feel fantastic to pharmacy, but it's not. It's just you've got to communicate back to that communication. They want to make sure the regulatory bases are covered. You need certain things to get your job done. You're not flying in any way. You're just formatting it in a way that you work together as a partner. So think about this partnering with your superior to make them successful and they will then help you be successful. It's just the, the typical human kind of uh, reaction. The other thing I often talk about when I'm out with younger uh, folks is how to disagree without being disagreeable. And you know if you tell somebody you disagree they're going to get defensive. So you're better off asking a number of questions. Um, you know, explain to me your thinking or tell me about, um, you know, why you're thinking this way. Have we considered? Bring me up to speed. Because by asking questions, you're continuing the dialogue, continuing to have that communication and um, you will learn some things in the process and you can get around to saying what if we did it this way without saying I disagree with you or you are wrong and getting them into a defensive mode. So learning to sort of <laughs> I guess weave through um, some of those sorts of aspects um, uh, is, is this leadership finesse and it's really a challenge teaching. Um, it's best observed, I think, from role models. And, you know, I credit the two years at Ohio State seeing Cliff finesse a lot of things and uh, learning that, you know, there are many different ways to get done what you really need to get done. And you don't need to take it head on. And you don't always need to go A to B to C if you can go around the corner in a better way. Um, and a lot of that is the Ohio State philosophy. I remember so much him saying, don't just take what you see here and put it somewhere else. Figure out what the needs are in your new organization and then design the best systems and best pharmacy services for it. So comments about this partnering with your superior. Um, because again, there you're the follower, even if you're the director of pharmacy, you've got somebody above you and it gets, my experience, is it gets trickier as you are the director because those above you may or may not even have any health care. Um, you know, they may not be a health care provider. The good news is if they are, they at least understand the lingo. I reported at Stanford for a period of time to, you know, the patient care services person who was a director of nursing. Good news, she understood the lingo. The bad news is, you know, she had her sense of what pharmacy should be doing. Um, if it's the administrative types that maybe don't have any of the health care, then there's an educational mode that you're needing to do uh, in partnering with that superior. Same thing if it's if you're a clinician and the person you're reporting to isn't that doesn't really come maybe from the clinical pharmacy background. How do you work together and how do you partner? So comments or, or questions about this sort of aspect? Um, Ali, did you get your, uh, your any of your uh, audio to work? Comments? Or anybody else? Comment on partnering with your 
your superior. Okay, go uh Pam. Let me whoa, I've Sarah, got good. I know we have some people who have some challenge. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Sorry, there. Go this ahead. Is John. I just uh, want to let you know we have some people who have a challenge with the audio pin, okay. and so they may not be able to talk. So we'll we'll kind of work around okay. that and do what we okay. can. Okay, Jeff. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. Go ahead. Or Jacob. Let Let me get you unmuted though first. That's the challenge with this stuff. Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, you know, the, the the comment that I had uh, was was based off earlier on, on one of the things that you said, um, and it all kind of connects on what I would change. You know, in my role now as the chief of pharmacy at the Portland VA, one of the experiences that I've, I've gained that didn't have prior was dealing with the unions, and that would be something I wish I could change was to remove the unions from my facility so I could directly interact with all my employees. But you know, that's not that's not in my control. And so, you know, one of the things that I've continued to do to, to change that and to partner with my superiors is, 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 is a twofold, is working with our union leadership as often as possible to build a positive relationship to create a forum to actually communicate directly with my employees versus through uh, a middleman. And in, in doing so, that's a that's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but it's also, as you said, aligning with your supervisors and the other folks in the institution who have a similar um, need and want, and making sure that we are all on the same page as we go forth and have the same voice as a facility leadership, that we know that the message that we're speaking is the same uh, message that our superiors are speaking as we're trying to mend a, a broken relationship right now to make it improved to then um, have better outcomes on implementing our programs. And so I think that that kind of connects both of your slides that we've been trying to do here. Yeah, and that's an excellent example of you got to assess your situation, and it's never going to be ideal, so how can you make the best of it? Um, and, you know, that would be a great article sometime, how to work effectively in a union environment, because a lot of people have that challenge. Um, that's great. Thanks for sharing. Julie, go ahead. One of the things that I've, you know, based on what's been discussed before and what I currently do is I work as a liaison between pharmacy services and our own physician practices, um, which has been a new position for the last 15 months. But it's my experience has taught me is that you can't always approach everything just from your perspective of pharmacy. You actually have to learn, you know, what the nursing perspective is, what the uh, business office is, what the physician's perspective is, so that you can effectively um, work towards creating solutions to meet needs. Even if it is a medication-related item or program or thought, you still need to come at it from everybody else's perspective or have at least an understanding so that you can work towards a solution. Yeah, and that's an excellent observation. I remember when I set up unit dose at Kansas going up and administering meds with nurses and boy did I have a different perspective of what we needed to do. So you're absolutely right. Walking in the other people's shoes is a phenomenal way to be more effective and influential and partner. Great comments. Thanks Pam. Go ahead or go ahead Julie. I just one more thing to add. I also think that you sure. can't always make sure you can't always come into a conversation assuming that everybody has the same level of understanding that you do with regards to an issue. Um, you know, asking clear other people have already said this, but asking clarifying questions, that type of thing. Um, even abbreviations. You know, we all use these acronyms all the time, and I found in my career that one of the main things I do is just ask, "What does that mean?" Yes. No, that's exactly, and even even within pharmacy, <laughs> we don't often. So, yeah, you're exactly right. And those are keys to effective communication. Fantastic. Pam, go ahead, Pamela, Alan. Pamela? Or Roger, go ahead. Uh, you're unmuted. Yeah, okay, Sarah. I mentioned before the relationship of having the uh, superior be the, uh, the towards the medical staff side, but I also I think I mentioned that the relationship that you have with the uh, chief financial officer is also extremely critical, and I used that uh, during the time when I was doing a study, actually for my uh, uh, doctor in public health degree, where I, I had a we were evaluating from both an outcome and a financial basis. Uh, the value of our clinical specialists being assigned full-time to the clinical services. 
And by the time that he, and he was on my, actually on my committee, and by the time we were done, he understood more about the value of pharmacists than I think most of our physicians did, although they were very uh, knowledgeable of that and supportive of that too. But we actually had a time when consultants came in and wanted to cut positions that really weren't involved with doing uh, dispensing of certain number of doses. And he's the one that stood up, aside from me, but stood up and said, no, that is not absolutely correct. Uh, the pharmacist doing uh, the uh, role that they do will have a bigger impact both on the clinical outcome but also the financial inc income because we had showed the absolute savings that we created for the institution on more appropriate drug uh, drug use. And so that's a very positive one and uh, sometimes uh, we think of it more adversarial but can be very positive. Well, and that's partnering with them, and, and you're absolutely right. Most people want to stay away from the finance folks, and so if you show an interest and you share with them what you're really doing, some of the, the examples of the impact that pharmacy makes, then they become your ally. So great learning, and thanks for sharing that, Roger. Uh, Sandy Cox, go ahead. Or Sadie, I'm sorry. Sadie? Um, not not really hearing you. Um, Rejecte, did you have a comment? You're unmuted. Anybody else want to? Let's uh, Mary. Let's move to the next slide. So, in addition to partnering with your superior, this whole working effectively with others. And again, this took me, I think, forever to learn some of the, you know, um, ways that you've got to help others be successful. And just because you're the pharmacist, even with the technicians, um, you know, how do you help people? How do you, what's your attitude? And as, as Fred mentioned, it's servant leadership. It's how can, what do they want to have happen and how can you be effective with them? And so often I think we think we're the pharmacist, and yeah, that buys us something, but it's really our ability to relate to other people and build relationships, as you've just heard talked about, that will enable us to be effective because we know what the other people need, we know how we can handle it, and how we can uh, work with uh, folks, and again, you know, we do a little of this in the clinical rotations and things, but a lot of it comes once you get into the work world of, of seeing how, observing other successful people and see how they do. If you attend a lot of meetings, watching the human dynamics in meetings, you know, is the person that throws a temper tantrum, is that the best way to handle a situation? Or um, I remember when I was on the ASHP board for a number of years, Joe Otis, the previous exec, um, he wouldn't say much. But towards the end of a discussion, he would ask one or two questions, most of the time clarifying, but it would really switch almost the entire sort of discussion. So you want to build your repertoire of ways of dealing with situations effectively to be influential. And it's all about working effectively with others and huge relationships, not only with physicians, but with nursing in terms of their need to use our medications, whether they're in automated cabinets or whether they're, you know, how it is to get their jobs done and having that personal relationship with those key people like Roger talked about with the uh, finance people are so key to having an excellent pharmacy service for our patients. So comments that people have about working effectively with others um, in, in their organizations. And certainly as you have residents and students, this is an area you can really help them with um, in terms of what does this mean? How do you really um, you know, get that translated um, into something that's effective um, within the practice environment? Other hey, comments? Sarah, this We're is getting... John. Yeah, go ahead. We're getting close to the top of the hour. Go ahead, John. Yeah, we have about eight minutes left, but I do want to chime in on this one. And, and mm -hmm. you know, one of the lessons I learned, honestly, to be really effective in working with um, really anyone, uh, your superior, someone who reports to you, your peer, is to really spend some time investing in getting to know them on a personal level. Um, I had a really interesting situation when I was working at Duke where I had an individual who was really opposed to one of the, the programs we were trying to implement. And, 
uh, immediately was very defensive. And um, once I took the time to get to know that individual and actually found out that he was a, a cyclist, he likes to ride bicycles, and so I invited him out and we rode a few times, all of a sudden his demeanor thawed. And he was a lot more receptive to my ideas once he understood that I was invested in him as an individual and not just trying to squeeze something out of him. Um, it's that whole idea of an emotional bank account. Uh, I think Stephen Covey is the individual who, yes. who introduced that concept, but that we try to deposit into others' emotional bank accounts so that if we have to, unfortunately, make a withdrawal, that there are some funds there to do so. Um, but you do have to actually deposit a few times, get to know people, um, know their families, know what makes them tick, and that makes you a much more effective peer um, or boss to those people. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and share your personal um, aspects as well with people. Um, and building, it's ideal to build those relationships before you absolutely need them, if possible. Um, it just makes work a lot more fun, as well as being able to be more influential. Well, we've got about six minutes left. Um, other questions or comments that anybody has? This is, you know, sort of your session. And... Uh, reason to keep. yeah go ahead whoever's unmuted um, Sarah I unmuted myself raise your hand we get you unmuted. going to go through and unmute okay. everyone and so then whoever can talk Good. and their phones work can talk and then okay. we can go from yeah, there. And the reason we usually keep you muted is because of background noise it's the most awkward part of this kind of um, and Mary, you want might want to briefly talk about the the CE, how how they're going to get that, what they oh, yeah. if um, so what they need to do. Do we have someone who wants to contribute to the conversation? Um, so I'll send an email out tomorrow, and it will have the link for the us. Uh, questionnaire post webinar um, and so once you complete that and it's a it's a Qualtrics survey once that's completed then you will receive your CE there's also a place on that survey to give feedback I know that there's been a lot of issues this webinar with phones not working and they're not being the audio pin I'll see what go to webinar and get that figured out um, but any other suggestions you have for this young alumni learning series for our next series of the three webinars, topics, suggestions, anything, um, please let us know. As we develop this series for young alumni, we really look for you guys to shape what you want to see. So, any other? And again, and again, these will be these are being recorded. So, <clears throat> if in the future you aren't able to attend, you can listen to them. And I need to draft some post. Um, questions and that would be answering those would get you your CE in the future for the if you're not attending it live but most of you are unmuted so are there other questions you have or comments in the few minutes we've got remaining we appreciate your your attendance and hopefully it's been helpful to you but Sarah just speak up go ahead hi this is Pam Allen um, I had a unique boss at least I think it was kind of unique but some other people may have had the same experience. Um, I had to ask him three times for just about anything I wanted. I, I think the first time he wanted to know that I was serious. Yes. So I had to come back a second time with more detail and more explanation. And usually by about the third time, several weeks later, it was more his idea than mine. And he would approve ah. it. So I thought yes. it was an interesting approach to trying yes. to justify yes. new programs, new uh, processes. Um, and um, it, it was just, I think it was very effective on his part. But I was serious I was going to come back. Right, right. Well, and I've heard some of my friends who are married say that's what happens with their husband. <laughs> it eventually becomes their idea to do something. So, again, as Cliff would say, whatever it takes to get that's done right. what you need to do. And once you figure that out, then, and again, he was, as you say, fairly smart. Because then if you, somebody wasn't serious about it, they wouldn't come back. So, Roger, that's go right. ahead. 
I, I didn't have anything else, sir. I, I had the mute. Okay. Uh, I did the microphone. Other than to say, I think you've done an excellent job, and uh, oh, well, appreciate uh, the younger people allowing some of the older people to join in today. <laughs> Well, I think we benefit from everybody's experience in this, and it's it's certainly a journey, and you know we're turning it over to you guys. The profession is in good hands, and we're going to be your patients pretty quickly here, and we're going to be demanding excellent pharmacy services <laughs> as we get into health systems. <laughs> so go ahead, uh, any of you that got your hands raised, you're all unmuted, so just go ahead, jump in. Any final comments? If well, not, we Sarah, I think you. we're uh, I think we're coming up on time. Definitely want to be respectful of that. I, I do want to once yeah. more thank um, the Lashley Leadership Program, the Executive Committee. Um, also, want to thank those folks that maybe aren't associated directly with the program, jumping on the call. You know, part of uh, Cliff Lashley's legacy is, is trying to educate all and trying to spread that leader, those leadership blessings beyond just um, our own alumni. So you are definitely welcome for further um, webinars and happy to have you. And then finally, want to thank Sarah. Uh, what a wonderful job, great way to kick off the series, really looking forward to how this continues the next two webinars and for those of you who have registered, yeah, just a reminder, uh, two weeks from today, uh, same time, uh, you'll get the, the links and all the webinar registration information uh, to join two weeks from today where we'll hear from John Armistead. So um, with that, I want to wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day and thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. John and Mary, why don't you stay on for a minute?